Hey everybody, it's EJ from iDesign.com and today I got a really fun sketch and tune tutorial for you on how to use it to create really fun blueprint style renders. I'm gonna cover a lot of very, very important sketch and tune tricks and tips for how to prevent those pesky flickering lines that happen whenever you render an animation using sketch and tune strokes. So stay tuned to the end of the tutorial for that and let's just jump in and create some blueprints. All right, so we're going to begin by showing you how you can grab some really cool CAD models at a website called GrabCAD. Uh, totally free. All you got to do is sign up for your free account. And these CAD files are really detailed, like highly detailed. Uh, basically like product renders. And these kind of 3D files are perfect for... Uh, using in like blueprint renders and stuff like that. So uh, one important thing is you want to try to find your uh, correct format uh, that you want to do what that you want to use. Uh, one new format that is brand new to Cinema 4D R20 is this step. I believe SketchUp is uh, compatible with older versions of C4D, but I just chose step. And the term that I searched for was dexterous humanoid robot hand. And if you put that in there, look at this super detailed uh, model of a hand, a uh, robot hand. So really cool stuff. Uh, basically, all you need to do is click on that, go to download files, and you'll download a zip file. And if you downloaded uh, this one particularly, it has a STEP or step file again supported uh, in R20. So if you want to download this hand and uh, have it in C4D format, I'll provide that file. Or, you know, with a lot of files, if you ever need someone to save it out for you, you can always find someone with R20 and have them save it out uh, for you. So with this STEP file, I'm just going to bring this and open this in C4D. And here we have the step import settings. Now, one important thing is by default, this instances is checked on. And this means that when you import your step file, it will actually use instances uh, because instances are supported. But the thing with Sketch and Tune that's very important is Sketch and Tune will not render strokes on any instance object. So what I'm going to do is just uncheck instances. So all we have is actual objects, pieces of geometry that we can then apply strokes to. OK, so that's the only setting you really need to worry about there. And then I'll just hit OK and you'll see the progress bar in the lower left corner there. It's co converting your file, all that good stuff. And here is our robot hand. So really cool, really highly detailed, okay? Now, one thing to know about CAD files is they're built to scale. Uh, so that means if I add a cube, we have this massive cube and tiny little hand. Uh, so what we're gonna do is delete that. And just so we're not dealing with like super, super small stroke settings and stuff in Sketch and Tune, I'm just gonna scale this on up. So just like so. So now we have, you know, this is our hand is as big as a cube, and that's what we're looking for. So now what I'm going to do is just kind of rotate this in position. And you can see this is kind of annoying because the axis centers off. So I can go into axis modification mode, and I'm just going to, you know, eyeball this, something like that, just so I can have an easier time. Just going to deactivate the axis for, uh, modification mode just so I can have a better, e easier time rotating this. So uh, maybe get this and we got our OK signal from our robot hand. So we're, we're all ready to rock and roll with Sketch and Tune. So let's go ahead and apply Sketch and Tune lines to this robot model. So first thing I'm going to do is go into Interactive Render Region and just make this bounding box big enough for our robot hand. And I'm going to bring up the quality slider, this little triangle here all the way to the top so we got 100% quality in our interactive render region and now what I'm going to do is just simply go to create and go to shader and create a sketch material now what this is going to do is a bunch of things by default number one if I go to my render settings here you can see sketch and tune render effect is already applied and we have three of the default types of lines already applied as well but one thing you're going to notice is we have a lot of lines missing. So we're losing a lot of the detail here. So what what is going on there? Well, typically this would be under the creases here. So creases are basically where 
a polygon bends at an angle. So if I get a cube here, you can see this is a crease right here, this little edge right there, okay? So basically, we're, we're missing something here. So one thing to understand about when you import a step file, so if I click on my Fong tag, which basically, if a polygon bends to a certain angle, it's going to create this Fong angle break or an edge break, and that will be an edge. So you can see that everything's kind of smoothed out, and that's because we don't have this angle limit turned on. Now, this is very important. So what I'm going to do is I just want to select all of the Fong tags in my scene for my object and just check them all on. So what I'm going to do is just click on the eyeball, poke the eyeball, and go to Tags. And we're just going to right-click and first click on a Fong tag so we have it active. And then I'm going to right-click on Fong and say Select All Fong. And what that's going to do is select all 83 Fong tags in my scene. And then I'm just going to check on that angle limit. Now watch what happens. We just added a whole bunch more lines due to the fact that we're now using this angle limit here. So let's just show how important Fong angles are as far as rendering creases because let me just go back into my render settings here because creases this angle right here is very dependent on your Fong angle on individual objects so what this means is that if your polygon angled edge is 10 degrees and above it's gonna render a line now if I go ahead and increase this minimum crease uh, degrees, you're going to see we're going to lose a lot more of that detail here. So if I bring this all the way up, we're slowly kind of bringing up the threshold as far as how many creases we see in our scene. So I'm just going to right click on these arrows to bring this back to its 10 degrees default and get all these lines back. Uh, but there we go. But this is not looking like a blueprint just yet. Uh, but I just really wanted to hit home on just how important Fong angles are, okay? Because creases are rendering those Fong angle edges. And uh, let's go ahead. But basically what I want to do is change this to a blueprint kind of look. And how we can do that is by going into the Sketch and Tune Shading tab. Okay, here's where we can choose this color this white background color to a custom color or just turn it off altogether. But what we're going to do is just grab a blue hue, like a blue, a blue color here for the background. And what I want to do is reuse the same background color to shade my object. So what's going on right now is it's just using the object shading, which since our objects have no materials applied to it, it's going to default to that bland gray material and it's just going to quantize that shading so we're only getting a few shades of that gray so instead of using the object shading what i'm going to do is just grab that same background color we chose here and that's going to be applied to our object as well so now we're only seeing these black lines and that's about it okay so now what we can do is double click on our sketch material and let's just rename this to be outlines okay and if I go here, I can change the color of my stroke. So if I just give this, you know, just a slightly, like maybe 95% uh, gray there. And now we got these uh, white lines here looking a lot closer to a blueprint there. Okay. So basically what's going on is this sketch and tune render effect is a global effect. So I can control what types of lines are showing up. But if I want to go in and affect those strokes, I'm going to go into my sketch material here. So this is where I'm affecting all of the stroke styles and stuff like that. Okay, so right now I can go in here, I can say adjust the thickness if I wanted to, but I think I'm digging that uh, amount of thickness there. And now all I need to do is if you've seen a blueprint, basically if you have a schematic, you can see the wireframe view of an object. So you can see like all the nuts and bolts inside of the object, you know, just for. Uh, you know, that's what a blueprint is, is you know how to build a product and you're going to see the x-ray view of all the details of that product. So right now, the only thing we're seeing is the outer edge. We're not seeing anything inside this object. So how we can actually go about and see lines or apply lines to the inner parts of an object is this option right here, default hidden. So right now we have no line type in this attribute here. So all I need to do is because I know I'm going to need to use like a dotted line or something like that, I'm just going to go command click and drag to duplicate this existing sketch material and I'm going to rename this to dotted lines. 
okay? And now I'm just gonna go ahead and drag and drop this into the default hidden. Now check out what happens. Just gonna have this render here, but we should see the wireframe view being stroked with this dotted line. So really, really awesome stuff. You can see what's going on there. Let's go into our dotted line by double clicking on it and let's make this thickness a lot smaller. So maybe uh, 0.5 or something like that, just to shrink it down a little bit. So now we can really tell the difference between what's the, you know, the main stroke and what are the inner X-ray strokes. So you can see what's going on there. And again, with most blueprints, this is a dotted line. The inner bits are a dotted line. Uh, dotted line. So what we can do is to create a dotted line, we're going to go to strokes and just check on pattern. And the default type is dashed lines. We want dotted. So I'm just going to go and you can see the dotted lines here, which actually looks pretty cool as well. Uh, but we can go in here and let's get uh, dotted. Where's dotted? There's dotted. And now we'll have dotted lines instead, which is really cool. Okay. So here is where we can adjust the overall scale of those dots, or at least the spacing between those dots, because this is not adjusting the thickness here. This is the thickness setting here. Okay. So this, this scale here is actually just scaling up the spacing between dots. So if I scale this up, you can see that now we just have a lot more space between our dots, okay? And this should render and update, and there we go. So uh, one thing that is important is if I shrink this down, if I shrink down this view and just let this render, look at how thick my lines got, okay? Now this is something where the strokes will actually grow in size depending on the resolution of the view that you're looking at. So since we're looking at a lower resolution, this actually grew in size uh, or actually stayed the same. So it actually looks like the strokes are thicker. Uh, but if we wanted to maintain the same amount of thickness, no matter what the size, what we can do is go ahead, and this is a very important setting, go into the Sketch and Tune settings, go to Render and check on resolution independent. Now what this is going to do is if I shrink down this view, you're going to see, if we just wait for it, that our lines are still relatively the same size. These aren't like super thick or anything like that. So resolution independent, we're going to keep, we're going to try to maintain the same uh, stroke thickness, no matter what the resolution. So you're not going to deal with your strokes looking thicker, depending on what resolution you're rendering out on. So very important kind of stuff there. All right. So let's go into our dotted lines again, and maybe we'll just bring up uh, the scale a little bit more because I think these are clustering a little bit too close together. So we'll just have that render. And now I think that's looking a lot better there. So one important thing with the inner X-ray bits here is if I go into my render settings, we're getting a lot of lines just from the folds, creases, and border line types. And if you don't know what folds and borders and creases and really everything in here, be sure to check out some of my other Sketch and Tune tutorials. I have a whole playlist on it and really dive deep into a lot of these kind of line types. Uh, but we're getting a lot of these, uh, a lot of bits of our geometry stroked just from these default types. But one thing that can really add a lot more detail is actually stroking where two objects intersect. And this is really going to help us as far as the inner bits go, uh, seeing the x-ray view. So let me just turn this on. And you can see that the objects are going to just, uh, if an object intersects itself, uh, it's going to show an intersection. But if we actually want to show all the intersections of all of the objects in the scene, what we can do is change this object from self and change this to project. And what this is going to do is if an object is intersecting another object in this entire project, we're going to get a lot more lines. So check this out. It's going to take a little bit longer to render because it's stroking a lot more pieces of geometry. You can just see how much uh, we got going on here. So depending on the model, you might want this, but I just think this is overkill. But maybe if you if you have a schematic and you need all this stuff, maybe you just there's nothing you can do to get away from this. Like we need to show all this detail on the inside of this object. So these line types can be very confusing, and I'm using a CAD model in the other scene that is basically perfect. There's not a lot of intersections. It's built for 3D printing, so there's not going to be a lot of overlap and stuff like that. So I just wanted to give another example 
of a scene. It's very simple. Got a couple cubes and a figure just kind of chilling in between all of these cubes. And basically what I want to do is grab all of our different lines. You can see that obviously we're missing the lines from where the figure is intersecting both of these cubes. So I'm going to turn on intersections. And by default, this intersections again is set to self. And you can see that we're still not getting those intersections. And that's because the intersections are only checking on a object by object level. So if the object's intersecting itself, because it's set to self mode, it will add an extra line. But it's not taking into account any of the other objects in the scene. These objects are not looking at each other to see if they're intersecting. So to do that, we're going to change this from self and change this to project. And what these what these line types are going to do now are check against all of the objects in your project and create those intersecting lines. As you can see right now, we're getting all these dotted lines where we're getting intersected, okay? So again, self-intersection, if you turn this on or off, this is just checking to see if the objects themselves are intersecting themselves, and you can either gain or lose lines this way, okay? And another very important aspect of all of this is you can see that this cube, we're missing this corner right here where the torso area or the stomach area of our figure is. So what's going on there is because of this culling. Okay, so culling is basically hiding objects that are not viewable by our camera view. Okay, so it just is a way to save processing time in 3D if something's not in the view of your camera, why waste processing power calculating it when you can't even see it? Okay, it's kind of like the default visible, default hidden. Why show uh, hidden lines when you're not uh, when they're not visible? Unless you specifically want that look, which is exactly what we're doing. We want to see those hidden objects and stroke them with this dotted line. So same thing with this hidden call. So right now we're not seeing all of the possible lines that we could see with all of these objects kind of stacked up on top of one another. So watch what happens. Look right in this area when I go and change this hidden call from self to project. You're going to see we gain that little edge back. So what that's going to do is again, it's very similar to the intersections and changing this from self to project is that this is checking against all of the objects in the scene, not just itself. So that's why we can now see through this other figure to the underlying cube corner here because this hidden call is looking at our entire scene. Okay, so two very important things. Again, depending on your scene, maybe you might even need to turn on outlines. It's all dependent on your scene type, but uh, I just wanted to show another example, a super simple setup, and kind of compare and contrast what works, what doesn't, because this scene isn't very complex, but our other scene, is pretty complex. Uh, one thing that is gonna really help as far as these dots go, so it's not so overwhelming, is double clicking on this dotted line uh, material and changing this color to not white, but maybe if we just sample a blue here and maybe make this a lighter blue so it kind of fades into the background more and is less pronounced uh, and kind of fades back into the background and really lets that outline stroke uh, really show uh, a little bit more contrast, so let's just let this run. So you can see it helps a little bit, just adding a little bit of bluish hue there. Uh, another thing that can help you here is going to the opacity and maybe using a distance modifier. So what this is going to do, if I click on the distance, and let's just let this uh, update here, but you can see the range is the object. So whatever part of the object is closely facing the camera is gonna have more opacity and whatever is further away back, you can see we just faded away some of the back parts of our uh, object, the ob parts of the object that are further away from our object kind of fades into the background. So this is a good way if you have way too much detail to kind of fade back some of these dotted lines so we can see more of that detail of the main strokes and it's not just so cluttered as far as all these different stroke types. So you can do that or you can just go in here and just turn off intersections altogether and we have a more simplified kind of scene. So you can see we have a lot less detail, but actually, I don't know. I think that's just way too few, uh, way less detail than I want. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just turn on intersections and leave that opacity uh, distance scale on. 
And just to get more of that detail back, I don't think it's too overwhelming. I think that's looking okay. So again, if we want to remove some of these strokes, we can up the creases, uh, maybe remove some of the details here, you know, all over the place there. So you can see we removed a lot of those strokes. So this is really handy as far as, you know, decluttering how many lines are being stroked or how many strokes are showing up on your geometry. Really important stuff. Uh, one setting that's pretty handy is if you want to apply just creases to maybe the 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 default visible objects versus the uh, hidden we can go in here and change this line materials to both and we can actually drag and drop outlines in each of the folds the creases whatever line types are active here we can actually just say you know what just have the outlines on all of these and just have the dotted on the intersections, okay? So that means that we won't have dotted lines on the border, creases, or folds. So this is just another level of control where you can actually have line types show up on individual, either default hidden or default, uh, def default, default uh, visible uh, and hidden lines there. So a lot of control there. I'm just gonna change this back to defaults. And what that's gonna do is apply all these line types to both the hidden and visible stroke types here. So looking good. So now let's go into some of these settings here on the strokes. I'm just gonna select both of them so we can edit both of these types and just go into the stroke tabs here and just cover a few important settings. Uh, a lot of people, <laughs> Uh, I know this pain quite a bit, but when you animate an object, sometimes you'll have flickering lines, okay? And I feel like that's that's just a problem. Sometimes you can't even get around it sometimes at all. But sometimes it helps to just check off this filter strokes because what this filter strokes does is remove certain types of strokes depending on what mode you have here. So. In this case, the default mode is overlay, so it'll actually remove strokes if a stroke overlaps in others. So what that can, what that can do is have uh, flickering strokes on your screen. So I've found that just deactivating this filter strokes if you have an object animated really helps prevent those flickering strokes. Now, just a rule of thumb, the type of movement that is really going to contribute to a lot of stroke flickering is rotation. So when you're animating an object, don't rotate it if you don't need to. And if you do rotate it, and this is kind of a tricky area, rotate it slow or if it just kind of flickers for a frame or so, maybe just cut out that frame or make it a super quick rotation. Uh, there's just really interesting ways to try to get around flickering strokes and stuff like that. Uh, another thing that is going to help a little bit is this join limit. So basically what's going on here is you're, you're kind of determining how to connect two points together. And I like to use this flat mode. And what this does is basically treats your object as a flat piece and doesn't try to connect things based on depth, which is what the uh, default was. So basically what this join limit is, is when a stroke ends and another stroke starts. So this join limit is basically when a angle is over 60 degrees, it's gonna create and break off a totally new stroke. And what happens is if this join limit's too high is you'll have a super long stroke connecting things. And again, if you're rotating your object, what can happen is that whatever is in your view, like if we rotate just like this, that angle can change and it could snap to somewhere else and you'll see a little glitch. So what I like to do is keep this join limit fairly small, like maybe 30 degrees. So what that means is you'll have a lot more strokes, individual strokes that will then connect closer to the initial stroke and have less tendency for it to jump around and have that kind of flickering. Uh, so try that. <laughs> And it's just like all these little little uh, finicky things you can do to, to help prevent all that. So one thing to note is that the shorter the join length, the speedier the render. So not only does this help prevent flickering, but it also helps speed up the render because the sketch and tune is not calculating these long strokes that it has to try to calculate and connect together. Okay, so really cool stuff. Um, 
One thing I'm seeing here is just, you know, just to fine tune this a little bit, let's just close out here. And if I select this little uh, fingertip, you can see we have these lines right here. And again, I can delete those and remove those by selecting all these objects. And again, going to their Fong tags here. So if I just select that Fong tag, uh, select this Fong tag here, and this one, what I can do is just raise this Fong angle limit, and that will sh that should remove some of those weird uh, lines there. Let me just see if this works. So you can see by raising that Fong angle, we are creating less of those breaks and raising that tolerance. So there you can see we can really find, again, Fong angles so important uh, when dealing with the crease line type and really re uh, removing some unwanted lines and stuff like that. So again, this is looking pretty good. I think I am digging it. Let's just go back into our render settings for one final time and go over some important uh, settings here. So one being anti-aliasing. You want to set this to best and use a sharper filter. The animation filter kind of blurs out uh, some of the detail of your object, and this prevents flickering as far as animation go uh, goes. But if you, especially if you're rendering a still, you want to use this cubic still image. And really, for sketch and tune work or any 2D work, you want sharper edges. So this is going to be the best kind of filter to use. Uh, and you can even up the min and max levels as far as the anti-aliasing sampling goes. Okay, so sharper edges always good when dealing with lines. And if we go into the sketch and tune render settings here, if you wanted to render out individual lines, you can always go in here and check on the uh, multi-pass here and you can separate the line types and you can even split the visible and hidden to render at as separate passes. So you can do your own compositing there, which is really cool. To have this multi-pass stuff show up in your render, you're gonna need to add the post effects render pass here. Okay, so just check that on post effects. That will render out your sketch and tune lines. So very important stuff. And again, make sure that you're rendering at this resolution independent here. Uh, one other thing is if you just think your strokes overall are a little bit too thick, this global thickness scale can scale down or scale up uh, all of your strokes in your scene depending on the percentage value you have here. So I'm just removing 20%. So everything's going down to 80% of the original scale. And there you go. I think it was super subtle what, what happened there. But one last thing, let's go and select both of our objects, uh, both of our stroke types here and go to render here. If you're animating, and this is really important as far as trying to remove a lot of line flickering, is if you have an object animating onto screen, what's going to happen is that if we have this clip strokes to screen checked on, is it's going to clip. Let me get out of interactive render region here. But if we have a stroke, it's going to clip and try to reconnect right here, okay? Instead of going all the way around and connecting, whoops, and connecting here, okay? So that means that as an object comes or comes onto screen or leaves screen, you're gonna have flicking, uh, flickering edges because the start and the end of the stroke is always changing. So if we have this clipped off here, the start of the stroke is here, and the end of the stroke is there, but if we check uncheck this clip stroke to screen, it's always gonna maintain that same stroke start and end. So if the stroke starts and ends about here, it's always gonna end right there, and it's not gonna bounce around and redraw itself each frame as it goes off screen. So very, very important stuff as far as trying to prevent flickering when animating your strokes and all that good stuff. So just one final render here. Hopefully you've found this tutorial uh, not only interesting as far as getting blueprint type of looks, but hopefully it gives you a few tips as far as preventing flickering and really uh, fine tuning how your sketch and tune looks as far as strokes goes and stuff like that. All right, so there you go. Some really fun sketch and tune blueprint style renders and hope you have a lot more insight as to what could be going wrong when you have glitchy line renders. So hopefully that 
helps you out there. If you have any questions on anything I covered, please leave them in the comment section below. And if you make any blueprint style renders, please be sure to tag me on Instagram. Love seeing what everyone's doing. Love liking, love commenting. So be sure to tag me so I can see it. Same thing on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Octave on there as well. And if you like this video, please hit that like button. Really would appreciate it. And if you like what I'm doing on my channel, please subscribe. It would mean so much to me. Ding the bell. You always got to ding the bell. So you can be the first to know when I upload a new tutorial. So thank you guys so much for your support. Hope you enjoy this sketch and tune renderer. And I'll see you in the next tutorial. Bye, everybody.